Hi, I'm Uncle Bob, and this is a special episode of Clean Code entitled Craftsman, Control Your Environment. So I was recently asked by one of my daughters, um, why are planets round? And I think that's an interesting question. Planets are round because of their own gravity. Uh, the gravity pulls inwards on every part of the object and forces it into the shape of a sphere. Of course, that's only true of large objects planet-sized objects. Smaller objects, like asteroids or meteors, aren't large enough for their gravity to crush them into a spherical shape. But the larger a planet becomes, the more spherical it becomes. The Sun is a million miles in diameter. It has a tremendous mass, and of course it's spherical. What other shape could it have? Because its gravity is just pulling in from every angle. So, planets are round because they have gravity. In my travels, I've seen hundreds and hundreds of development teams, some of them healthy and productive, some of them crippled and clumsy. One common trait of the healthy development teams was that they were in control of their development environments. By the same token, the unhealthy teams had often lost that control. What does it mean for the developers to be in control of their development environment? It means that they have control over their computers, their installations, their configurations, their databases, their schemas, their tools, their platforms, their frameworks, and anything else that is involved with their development environment. For example, I've seen teams that were hobbled by the fact that they weren't allowed to reboot processes on their own development machines. They didn't have the super passwords to go in there and reboot processes. So they had to call system administrators on the phone and beg them to please log into their systems and reboot processes. This is just nuts. I mean, developers cannot work efficiently if they have to depend on others to do the simplest operations within their computers. Developers should have all the secret super user passwords, and they should be able to perform any operation necessary to manipulate their machines. The developers need to be the masters of their development machines. I understand that there are issues of security and safety involved here. Corporations don't want developers downloading foreign processes on their machines and executing them because those foreign processes may have security leaks that expose the internal network to mischief or even outright attack. There may also be laws and regulations involved. Rules like Sarbox might forbid developers from performing certain operations on sensitive networks. But this doesn't mean that the developers should not be masters of their own environment. It just means that the network that the development machines are on should be separated from more sensitive network areas. This is the Vegas principle. What happens on the development network stays on the development network. The development environment has to be an environment that is safe for things like experimentation and research, things that would be risky if done on the production or the corporate environment. Another common breach of development authority involves databases. It's not at all uncommon for me to come across teams that are unable to make schema changes on their development machines. They don't have the rights. Instead, when they want to change a table or add a column, they've got to get on the phone and call a DBA. <sighs> 
The DBAs are busy people, and they've got lots of important work to do. They'll be happy to discuss with you the addition of your column, but they're going to have to convene a review meeting to discuss the implications. If that meeting goes in your favor, then they're going to have to schedule a prototyping run to do query analysis on your changes to see what the impact on the enterprise is. And if all that goes well, then they will invoke the mandatory 90-day waiting period where they publish your intended changes to all the other development teams to see if any of them are concerned about how your changes will impact them. If after you run this gauntlet everything is still going well, then they'll be happy to stop by your lab someday and add that silly little column you wanted to your development machine. Okay, that was all a little over the top. Most DBAs are not really that austere. And yet it remains true that many development teams do not have control over their development databases. This is insane. Developers need to run experiments. They need to be able to try different schema options. They have to have control over their development environment. This doesn't mean that developers have absolute control over the schema. After all, DBAs have a responsibility to protect corporate data assets and to make sure that systems run quickly, efficiently, and safely. So DBAs need some control over the changes that developers want to make to database schemas. However, this kind of oversight can be implemented with a simple review process that doesn't prevent developers from experimenting in their own development environment. But look, this is a two-way street. The draconian rules that prevent developers from manipulating their own environment probably arose because at some point those same developers were careless with schema structure. Developers, it's important for you to understand that DBAs are not your enemies. They have a huge responsibility to keep the enterprise systems safe, secure, and performant. So when the DBAs express concern over a schema change, listen to them and work with them. Don't put the DBAs into a position where they have to exert some extreme control. DBAs. You need to find a way to work with developers without hamstringing them. Exerting paralyzing controls over developers puts them in a position where they have to work around you, not with you. I've worked with teams that weren't allowed to use open source tools like JUnit or a Fitness or even Cucumber because the tools group hadn't given their stamp of approval to those tools. This is just nonsense. Development teams need to be in control of the tools they use. Now I understand that some companies might be a little bit worried about cowboy development. I mean every developer using their own tools and their own languages and just going off on their own doing anything they want to and that's probably not such a good thing. I agree that some level of control and management is necessary. However, if a development team decides that it's in their best interest to use a non-standard tool, then they should be able to do so without inordinate delay. Developers, please understand that the organization has a vested interest in maintaining certain standards. You should not overthrow those standards for light and transient causes. However, Companies need to understand that if development teams are not allowed to experiment outside the bounds of the current standards, then those standards will never be improved. Other tools like Spring and Hibernate are more problematic. They actually become part of the software that gets deployed to the customer. So clearly the organization has a deep and vested interest in controlling tools like that. Even so, 
when a development team decides that it's in their best interest to introduce a new set of tools into the production environment, they should not be thwarted by a bureaucratic, arduous, long and tedious process. Of all the constraints that corporations put on their development teams, probably the most odious is the source code control system. The problem is that corporations view their source code as a significant corporate asset and they've been sold on the idea that the best way to protect that asset is with an expensive and complicated source code control system. So they invest in a large, complicated, expensive and clumsy tool. A tool so large that it requires more than one administrator just to keep the behemoth from imploding under its own weight. And then they put that tool on the backs of the development teams by absolutely enforcing its use. Of course, this is all very well intentioned. And the business is right to be concerned about protecting their source code assets. But still, nothing can have quite so dramatically negative effect on efficiency as a rickety, stodgy, clumsy, slow, complex old source code control system. I mean, if it takes you 30 minutes to check in your code, well then you're just not going to check your code in very often, are you? And if you don't check your code in very often, well then you're going to have to deal with some pretty large merges. When the source code control tool is big and clumsy and slow, you don't want to use it very much. And that forces development teams into branch per feature because they don't want to use the tool very much. Using branch per feature, the developers create branches for each new feature they're going to develop. And they'll keep those branches separate for entire iterations or possibly several iterations. Uh, and they won't check them in until the features are actually working. Then, when that feature is finally ready to be delivered, there's a big merge to perform. And that merge takes a lot of time and it's very risky. It's not uncommon for release schedules to be completely derailed because the difficulty of a complex merge was underestimated. A better strategy is called branch per task. This is where developers take out a branch for a day or even less than a day because the task they're going to do is so small and then they merge it right back into the main line. Clearly, if you've only had the branch out for a day, there won't be much of a merge to perform, so the risk is very slight. The problem is that if a source code control system is slow, then developers aren't going to want to use it even once a day, because who wants to spend a significant part of your day waiting for a slow tool? The advent of distributed source code control systems has added a whole new dimension to this issue. These tools are typically very lightweight, very simple, and very, very fast. When developers use a distributed source code control system, there is no main line. Instead, every developer maintains a complete history of the entire source code system on their personal development machines. Developers use the branch per task approach, but they're checking in code into their personal repositories every few minutes, typically every time they get a unit test to pass. This creates a very fine-grained sequence of commits that the developers can use to back out dead ends or experiments. Developers don't need to continuously merge with the main line. There's no main line to merge with. Instead, the developers can merge with each other at their convenience. For example, imagine that Jim and Jane are both working on tasks for a given user story. Instead of merging those tasks back into the main line once they complete them, they can just merge together. Then they can continue working on more tasks for that story. Eventually, Paul, 
who is working on another task in the same story, merges his changes with Jim. And then the three of them work together to get the whole story working. Once it's working, they merge it with John, who's responsible for accumulating all the changes for that iteration. In effect, John's machine is holding the main line. If the team so desires, and they often do, they can push their changes to a mainline repository that they establish by convention. This repository is nothing special. The distributed source code control tool doesn't treat it in any special way. It's just another repository like everybody else's. About three years ago, I transitioned fitness from a subversion repository to a GitHub repository. And although I hadn't expected it, the difference was astounding. When fitness was controlled by subversion, I kept a really tight control on branches. There weren't any. Instead, developers who were working on features were told to merge the mainline into their code every day or so. When they checked their changes in, those changes appeared to have been made in the main line as though the developers had been sequentially taking turns. You can see the effect that this had on the change history. Nobody took out branches because branching was painful. Of course, this pseudo-sequential mode imposes overhead. Daily merging with the main line is disruptive at best. It creates a set of obstacles that sometimes consume significant amounts of time. And then one day, almost on a whim, I just moved the fitness repository from Subversion to GitHub. And everything changed overnight. I mean, look at the funny branching that was happening. It's not that I relaxed the rules at all. I didn't expect anything would change. But boy, was I wrong. The distributed source code control system made branching so easy and made merging those branches so incredibly simple that fitness developers discovered that it was the easiest way to work to keep their branches out for several days at a time while committing their changes every hour or so into their private branches. So we switched from our tightly controlled branch per task mode into a strange variation of branch per feature coupled with extremely frequent commits. This has worked very well for us, and we'd certainly never go back to single line code management. Distributed source code control systems change branches from something that needs oversight and control and management into simple tools that individual developers can use on a whim. And the change in efficiency is startling. Simple branching like this changes the way developers think about the source code. Instead of thinking about it as though it were a single entity in a given state, they begin to think about it in terms of a sequence of commits along branches that can be applied in any order that suits them. Developers often make multiple branches of their code and then manipulate those branches independently. So let's say Jim is working on a new feature and he's checked out the code into a special branch that he's using to develop that feature. And then he gets interrupted by a bug in the field. So when he goes and he checks out a new branch from the latest release, and he fixes the bug and checks it back in uh, and commits the latest release, then he can go back to his feature branch. And if he wants to, he can even apply the bug fix commits to the new feature. Thinking about your source code as a sequence of commits the way a distributed source code management allows creates a tremendous amount of flexibility. 
I mean, you can apply those commits in any order that seems to make sense to you. You can apply bills changes before bobs or bobs before bills, or you can apply them mixed together. You can even go back in time and apply your changes to any previously valid state of the system. Given the sheer power of these tools, it seems absurd that corporations would constrain their developers by forcing them to use the old-style sequential and centralized source code management systems. Developers need to work in a manner that gives them the most flexibility and maneuvering room without compromising the safety and security of their organization. One common solution to this problem is to accept both that the organization needs a big, expensive, slow source code control system, while the development team also needs a lightweight, fast, and flexible source code control system. Development teams often achieve this mix by using the lightweight tool during their normal daily work and then checking the source code into the corporate system, maybe once at the end of every sprint or even once at the end of every release. This satisfies both parties and gives the developer a nice, lightweight, flexible tool to use. So, let's sum up. Software craftsmen, you need to be in control of your computers, your tools, and your software environments. You must work with your employers to find creative solutions that protect their safety and security while affording you the flexibility and control that you need. Managers, do not hamstring your development teams with draconian rules and regulations that express distrust. Instead, work with the development teams to make sure that you are protected, but also to ensure that they have the flexibility to work efficiently. So, that's it. I hope you enjoyed yourself and I hope you learned something. And remember, keep watching on cleancoders.com for more videos for software craftsmen. Many dogs, let's go. Huh, huh, dogs, huh. Let's go. Huh, huh. Good dog. Come on, dog. Huh, huh. Good job, good job.